Thank you, Daniel. When I was six years old, there was only one thing I wanted for Christmas more than anything else in the whole world, and that one thing was Clip Clop the Wonder Horse. (laughs) I, I was not the kind of kid who would beg and plead and cajole for a present. I I didn't whine, I didn't bargain, I was very direct. I know some of you can hardly believe that. (laughs) When when the commercial for Clip Clop the Wonder Horse came on TV, I would yell, Mom, Mom, there he is, there's Clip Clop. Come on, Mom, come in here, this is what I want for Christmas. I want that, Mom, I want that thing, that's what I want for Christmas this year. I just put it right out there. And I feel like, like all six-year-old boys can do, I filled mom in on all the details. And if you've ever had the experience, some of you are nodding, of asking a six-year-old boy what they want for Christmas, you're going to get a list. And it may only have one thing, but you'll get all the details. And I did all the things, mom, like it makes sounds and you can rock any direction and it's so great, mom, that's what I want. <laughs> to which she replied, we'll see. Now, some of you are chuckling because you're parents and you know what that means. Some of you kids don't yet know what that means. You will. It means there's a remote possibility, but probably not. That's what we'll see means. But just like in the story about Hugo that Pastor Daniel read, my dad really came through. He stayed up until 1.30 in the morning putting Clip Clop together. I was so stoked on Christmas that year. I think I spent half the day on that horse. And I've got proof. Um, (laughs) Six-year-old Casey. By the way, the Superman wallpaper, apex-level home decoration for a boy's room, right? Like... uh, but I, canteen, flashlight, telescope, I am ready to go. I don't know, my parents didn't trust me with the knife. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I, I love it. I spent half the day on that horse. If you're, if, if today is your first time at Chapel Rock. I am so glad you're with us today. For those watching online, thanks for logging in. Uh, I, I'd love an opportunity to, to, to meet you. And I want you to know that tonight for, at 5.30 and 7, we're going to have... Uh, a wonderful, beautiful time. The stage is full of chairs and, and stuff for a reason. We went really simple this morning because we're talking about humility. We're going to pull out all the stops tonight. So uh, you will want to be here either at 5.30 or 7 o'clock this evening. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been in a sermon series called It Runs in the Family. And we've been looking at Jesus' family tree and some of the names that are listed in Matthew chapter 1 uh, and Luke chapter 3 and how Jesus himself in his life and ministry echoes those qualities and even perfects them. We see those those qualities that that are present in his family tree, echoed and perfected in Jesus. Qualities like faith and purpose and royalty. And today we're talking about humility. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. As you're turning there, I need to let you know that we we actually have a problem, but the problem is not in the text. I mean, there are some difficulties, and I'll address that briefly, but the problem is not with the text. The problem is that for many of us, we've heard this story so many times that in order to keep it interesting, we've pushed it to one extreme or the other. Sometimes we take the Christmas story and we make it really clean and shiny and happy, you know? We, we got this, this made-up donkey. He's not in the text. This made-up donkey gets Joseph and Mary. They're just in time, you know. And then the, the made-up innkeeper, because there's not one in the text either. He's, he's all distraught, but he makes sure that Joseph and Mary, ha- the stable is nice and cozy and warm. And you've seen the pictures on the Christmas cards, right? Everything is shining. It's like the craft aisle at Walmart just exploded onto the card. There's glitter everywhere, right? It's baby Jesus in the manger is shining. You know, the angel in the sky is shining. Joseph and Mary are shining. Even the made-up donkey is shining. Everything is shining. <laughs> but the part of our brain that can tell we're being told a fairy tale rejects that. And so sometimes we swing the, swing the pendulum hard the other way. And we turn the story of Christmas into a frightful tale. I mean, Dickens couldn't do it better. We make Joseph and Mary frazzled and stressed. We make the innkeeper a mean old codger that wouldn't give a young couple a break. 
We put Joseph and Mary and Jesus in a drafty cave out back and we cover everything in a giant layer of dirt and poverty. We have a problem. The problem is, if you do your homework, you find out that neither one of those pictures is really very accurate. What I want to do today is to tell you that the birth of Jesus was not some happy, shiny fairy tale where everything is shining and covered in glitter. But neither is it some tense, dramatic thriller. It was a plain, ordinary, everyday, humble birth. That's the point. Here's the big idea today. Jesus' life was the ultimate example of humility from his birth to his death. And since that runs in the family, we can live that way too. Now we see a lot of examples of Jesus' humility in his ministry. Let me just remind you of a few. In, in, in Matthew chapter 9, right, Jairus comes to Jesus and he says, My daughter is dying. Will you come lay hands on her and heal her? Okay. So Jesus stops what he's doing. And on the way there, he's interrupted by this woman with, with a dysfunction that causes her to bleed consistently. Jesus is okay with interruptions. Overly proud people don't like to be interrupted. Maybe you've had a conversation with one. Humble people can be interrupted. Jesus was interrupted. Jesus in John 4 meets this woman at a well. And even though he had a right in his culture because of gender differences and culture differences, he had a right to command her to give him a drink. He certainly had the right as the creator of the universe in a human body. He had the right to command her. Instead, what's he do? He asks, will you please get me a drink? He asked. He didn't have to, but he did. In Matthew 22, verse 19, we read that Jesus it doesn't have any money. He's talking to the Pharisees about money. And he says, you know, they ask, do we have to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he says, give me a denarius. It was a day's wage. What's that mean? He didn't have one. He had no money in his pocket. We also find out in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, he was functionally homeless. A guy comes to him and says, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. And what, how's he respond? Birds have nests. Foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And the, probably the ultimate example, in John 13, he washes the feet of his disciples. The first time I went to Israel, I got seated on the plane, over one row and back, from a rabbi. I think he was a rabbi. He could have been a wizard, but I think he was a rabbi. <laughs> Long black cloak, gold embroidery, like... You know, big beard. I mean, like, I, I'm pretty sure it was not a wizard. I'm pretty sure it was a rabbi. And the reason I know is that his disciple was in the seat in front of me. And the guy never stopped moving. He served his rabbi for a nine-hour flight. Newark to Tel Aviv. Constantly up out of his seat. Over and over and over again. He cut his rabbi's food. And we read in John 13, Jesus, the rabbi, washes his disciples' feet. The humility of Jesus just blows me away. He's the ultimate example of humility. And, and while the scandal of the God of the universe taking on our frailty in humility should never fail to move us, he comes by it honestly. <laughs> Look at the family he comes from. Read with me Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah, the last king that Matthew mentions, was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of Methan. Methan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. By the way, 14, what's the point? Three times the number of perfection doubled. That gives you... There's a, there's a reason for those numbers. Now, 
Have you ever heard of any of those people other than Joseph and Mary? No. <laughs> Unless you've recently been reading Ezra and Nehemiah in your Bible, in your Old Testament. If, you've, if, if in your devotions you've recently read Ezra and Nehemiah, you might recognize the names Shealtiel and maybe Zerubbabel. He's mentioned in Jeremiah the prophet a little bit. That's it. Like you read these names, like I don't have any idea who these people are. Yeah. There's a reason for that. And if you go and you look at the parallel list, I say parallel loosely, in Luke chapter 3, it's the same thing. Like I've never heard of these people. Say, what do you mean roughly parallel? There's a totally different list of names. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. The genealogy of Jesus actually splits at Zerubbabel. It does it at David, and it comes back together at Zerubbabel, and splits again, and comes back together in Joseph. And the scholar, this is the the one difficulty with this, they have no idea what's going on. They really don't. Some people have said, well, this is the family line of Joseph, and this is the family line of Mary. Some people have said, well, it's Joseph's paternal line and maternal line. We don't know. Families are weird. Even Jesus' family got weird, right? It's okay if yours is. Okay, that's all right. But in in the 400 years from the return from exile in Babylon, 586 BC, they go off into exile. 70 years later, they come back. In the 400 years in between the, the, the return from exile under Zerubbabel, right, recorded in Ezra and Nehemiah in your Old Testament, Until the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah when he's offering incense in the altar. In that 400 year time span, Jesus' family goes from being kings to being just ordinary folk. Craftspeople. Tradesmen. Maybe small business owners, but blue collar. 400 years, they go from being the king to being just ordinary. I don't have a lot to tell you about these people because we don't know anything about them except their name. That's kind of the point. It's part of the plan. And it's how we see Jesus' humility in his birth. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the ordinary humility of Jesus' birth. St. Hilary of Poitiers, a 4th century bishop, said this, we dishonor him by ignoring the mystery of the humility which he assumed. That said, it's no mystery why the God of the universe would descend so far. He loves us. He wants us to spend eternity with him. But knowing the reason why does not diminish how far Jesus descended. You heard the passage read earlier from Philippians 2. It's exalted above all. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he took on our humanity. He took on our frailty. So let's not dishonor our Lord's humility by throwing a layer of glitter over the events of the birth and turning it into a fairy tale. In the same way, or neither should we demean the love and provision of God the Father for his Son by making the story of his birth a barely averted nightmare. The Lord of glory, the high King of heaven, was born as an ordinary baby to ordinary parents in an ordinary town in an ordinary house. That's his humility. And I know that doesn't fit the fairy tale Hollywood slash Hallmark greeting card image that we have in our head, right? We've got this mental picture, a lot of us, of Joseph and Mary, you know, on a made-up donkey riding into the desert in a starlit night, and Bethlehem's not in the desert. (laughs) And and they get there and they find that there's no room in the inn and, and Mary's just about ready to give birth. It's a close call. None of that fits the text. You know, we got this picture of them having to go out to some drafty cave or or barn in the backyard. It's a complete fabrication. And believe it or not, it goes all the way back to an early 3rd century work called the Proto-Evangelium of James. And it contains all sorts of legendary stuff about Jesus' birth and childhood. All of it's bogus. What do we know from the Gospels? It was very ordinary. It was very humble. Listen, Joseph would not have had to search and search and search to find a place to stay in Bethlehem. Read the list in Matthew 1. 
All he's got to do is walk into town and quote that list. He's got somewhere to stay that night. He's a descendant of David. This is his hometown. He, he absolutely has somewhere to stay. In the Middle East, the family you come from is hugely important. We're so individualistic in our Western culture that we don't, we, we read that into the text. It's not there. Luke tells us that Joseph was from the house and line of David. Matthew makes the point unambiguous by tracing his family line. People in Bethlehem knew Joseph. It's not like when you... In, in 2003, Deb and I moved to Billings, Montana to plant a new church. I knew one guy in that city of the size of Wayne Township, 120,000 people. I knew one dude. I had his phone number. That's it. We knew nobody. It's not like that. He had family there. All he's got to do is walk into town and quote this list that we read today, and he's got a place to stay. It would have been a crime against Middle Eastern hospitality to put Joseph and Mary and Jesus in a cave or even in a barn. They were in a home. They were warm. They were safe. But the house was full. So they put Jesus in the safest, warmest softest place they can find a stone manger full of hay Kenneth Bailey says in his book Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes simple village homes in Palestine often had but two rooms one was exclusively for guests the main room was a family room where the entire family cooked and ate and slept and lived the end of the room next to the door there was either a few feet lower than the rest of the floor or was blocked off with heavy timbers so here you can see a, a a depiction of what an early first century house in Palestine would have looked like. The stable, you've got a couple steps down to this lower level. They had troughs cut into the floor. Those were the mangers. It says the guest room, that's the word Luke uses in Luke 2, that was full. Why? Someone else beat them there. There was, a, there was a census, right? They had to go back to their hometown to register. The guest room was full. So where is Joseph and Mary and Jesus? They're with the family. Because they're family. They're warm. They're safe. And Jesus in humility is literally placed on the floor. He descended as low as you can get. Each night into this designated area of the stable, the family cow and the donkey and a few sheep would be driven. Every morning those same animals were taken out. It was mucked out and cleaned. Kenneth Bailey goes on to say, and he lived with Bedouins for 20 years. He knows what he's talking about. He said, why weren't they invited into the family guest room? The reader might naturally ask. The answer is that the guest room was already occupied by other guests. The host family graciously accepted Mary and Joseph into the family room of their house. Think about this. It is in the ordinary, everyday humility of Jesus' birth that the God of the universe poured out all his fullness into a tiny, helpless baby. It was into that ordinary humility that the eternal one, immortal, unbounded, unlimited, stepped into time and dwelled among us as one of us. And I would contend that it is not until you see the ordinary humility of Jesus' birth that you can really know how God wants to transform your ordinary everyday life by the power of Jesus Christ at work in you. So how does he do that? Well, he dwelled among us as one of us, and now through the Holy Spirit, he dwells within us. His humility runs in the family. And it's because he came into the world in a very ordinary way, I think, that we are enabled and ennobled to live a very extraordinary life. So let's talk about that. We talked about the ordinary humility of Jesus' birth. Let's talk about the extraordinary lives of Jesus' humble people. Someone once said Christ was content with a manger when he was born so that we could have a mansion when we die. I like that. I think it's true. But I believe that the incarnation, Jesus' birth, is supposed to change us in this life too, not just the next one. I think we can derive a couple principles from this passage that help us live extraordinary lives that God wants us to have. Here's the first one. Number one, God may be doing a miracle in the midst of your ordinary. God may be doing a miracle in the midst of your ordinary. 
I've been trying to tell you today that the specific circumstances of Jesus' birth to the outside observer would have looked very, very ordinary. So, well, what about the star? Okay, yeah, that's different. And that factors into the story later, right? What about the shepherds? Okay, yeah, they show up eventually. But Joseph and Mary arriving, finding a place, having the baby, very, very ordinary. Exceedingly humble. Jesus came from a family that by the time of his birth were no longer aristocrats. They were normal folks. And it's in the middle of that that God does a profound miracle. The greatest miracle that ever was happening. God was born as a man. Creation itself couldn't be contained. So yes, the stars explode in glory and angels come and they sing. Yes. My point is, you don't know what God may be doing in the middle of your ordinary. God may be doing a miracle in the middle of your ordinary day. So I would encourage you on this Christmas Eve to keep your radar up and on. Because when you're unwrapping presents tonight or tomorrow, I don't know how your family does it. We're a tomorrow kind of family. God may want to do something there. When, when, When you go out to return the stuff that doesn't fit on Tuesday and everybody's stressed or tired, God may want to do a miracle in the middle of your ordinary. And because Jesus lives in us, because Jesus was humble enough to come here and live our life, you need to understand that God may want to do a miracle in the middle of your ordinary. This Christmas, don't be confused. The ordinary may be God's method of changing the world through you. Sometimes, he lets us see beyond the ordinary. And lets us participate in his work to do something extraordinary. And that's the second thing, that God wants you to do ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Let me tell you a story. Lee Eklov is one of my favorite pastor writers. And he talks about a time that some folks in his church made a connection in their community. Jim and Evie first met a lady named Kim when she was handing out food samples at the store. You ever been to Costco, Sam's Club, when they're handing out the food, right? That's the little thing on a toothpick. Here, eat this. You know, like, um, and they, they met Kim, and she was just outgoing and gregarious and smiling, and so they invited her to church. They're just ordinary people. They said, would you want to come with us? She goes, yeah, but not because she was excited about it. <laughs> um, She called herself an angry atheist. But Jim and Evie invited her to their home after church. (laughs) And she rode with them that day. And then she came back the next Sunday. Locked and loaded. Man, she was was ready. Never came off as angry, but dominated the Sunday school class with her questions. Right? And, And some of them were honest and some of them were just skeptical. But people were praying for Kim. And gradually she warmed up. She moved, she said, I'm no longer an angry, I'm an agnostic. I'm not an angry atheist anymore, I'm an agnostic. And that might be some of you here right now. Her questions and opinions just kept on coming. Months passed. Gradually she kind of relaxed as she continued to be there. Some of her questions got answered, some of them just didn't really matter anymore. What mattered most for Kim was being around Christians and seeing their ordinary, everyday humility and love for one another. She liked being part of the church family. And they liked her spunk. They liked her smile. They asked her to be on the greeter team. She was was a natural. She was good at it. And so she served that way for a while. And then Easter rolled around. And they were getting ready for their Good Friday service. And they asked Kim, hey, I've sat next to you in church and you got a good voice. Would you like to sing in the choir? Okay. So she went to practices and she began to sing these songs about Jesus' death on the cross in our place for our sin. And those words just kept coming out of her mouth over and over and over again. And good Friday afternoon, they had one final practice before their service that evening. And the choir director ask a man in the back row named Jim if he would pray. Jim was standing directly behind Kim. 
She heard wrong. She heard her name. What she heard was, Kim, would you pray? And before Jim could get a word out, she said, okay. Dear Heavenly Father, and began to pray. She prayed. She thanked God for the gift of his son, for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. She said how wonderful she thought that was. She thanked God for how much he loves us. And she said, amen. And everybody in the choir is kind of looking at each other like, did we just hear what I think we heard? Brother Lee went up to her and he said, "Um, Kim, uh, that, that sounded a whole lot like a Christian prayer. She said, I think it is. So they stepped aside and he took her confession. And she gave her life to Jesus on Good Friday. Here's the interesting thing, he writes. No one of us led Kim to Christ. All of us led Kim to Christ. The whole church preached as did other friends from other churches. If Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, would come and be born in such an ordinary fashion, in order to accomplish such an extraordinary thing, then what could he do with your ordinary? What could he accomplish with a church body known in their community for their humility? I don't know what the next week looked like for you. Probably some time off. I sure hope you get a chance to rest and enjoy the holiday. Probably a lot of holiday stuff over the next few days. But can I challenge you to do your ordinary things in extraordinary ways? Would you allow Jesus to do a miracle in the midst of your ordinary, everyday, humble life? Would you walk out of here today filled with the power and the presence of God to do extraordinary things in very humble ways? I only had Clip Clop in my room for about six months. That summer we moved to Joplin, Missouri, a little bit smaller bedroom for my brother and I to share, and there wasn't room for our bunk beds and Clip Clop. And the dresser and all, you know. So Clip got, got moved to the back porch. And there he got all faded. And his springs got rusty. But he still gave great joy to me and my siblings. I was a little worried. <laughs> when, when there were times I thought Clip Clop's springs might not make it. When my younger sister went out there and did some X Games style extreme Clip Clopping. He hung in there. You know, I don't really know what happened to Clip Clop. But if Clip Clop could think like Hugo the hobby horse could, I would imagine that he did not enjoy moving from the glory of a boy's bedroom with Superman wallpaper (laughs) to the back porch in those hot, humid Missouri summers. to a faded and rusty humility of an outside toy. But a true gift knows that its life is not its own. It is given out of love for the sake of another. I remember reading somewhere, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's humility. The God of the universe, the eternal one, immortal, unbounded, stepped into the ordinary humility of our daily lives to give himself as a gift for our salvation. So here's my question this Christmas Eve. Have you opened your gift? Jesus very humbly gave himself on the cross in your place for your sin. 
And if you haven't given yourself back to him, you're not ready to really celebrate Christmas. Maybe you want to make that decision today. In just a second, we're going to sing a couple songs. I I know we already have some who have decided to do that. I would welcome you, if you're ready today, to to yield your life to Jesus, to receive the gift he has for you. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, for you. And maybe today you're like, yep, Christmas Eve, 2023. That's the day I gave my life to Jesus. Maybe you have a a, a need that's weighing on your heart today, would like someone to pray with you. Our pastors will be down front. We'd love to pray with you. If you want to have a conversation like, I I just want to talk with somebody about something going on, our next step room under the yellow awning, the door will be open, one of our leaders will be in there. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and we're going to sing together. And you respond as God leads you today.